Lee, do you need levels too? Yeah. Is this working? Are you guys seeing it clear? Okay, great. And is the lighting good, Sam? Perfect. Sam, do you need to stay up here for a minute? Just for you to make sure that our levels are also good with our mics. Everything look good? Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here and tuning in. Today we'll have our situational update from Commissioner Morrison, hear from General Roy from FEMA, and get a transportation update from Secretary Flynn. This weekend, I spent time in Orleans County meeting with people who were impacted, as well as uh, taking a look at the substantial damage to the Ethan Allen manufacturing facility and speaking with the town manager about the ripple effect the temporary closing will have on the region and the hundreds of employees and families. I was also in Barrie, Johnson, Waterbury, and Montpelier. Two weeks after the worst of the flooding, it's clear in each community I visit how much work we have ahead of us. I also continue to be inspired by all those working on our response and recovery efforts especially municipal and local officials who, uh, who take on a ton of responsibility during emergencies like this. Mr. Morrison will discuss how we continue to work with them and reiterate the SEOC structure we have in place should cities and towns need more assistance and how to request it. Yesterday I joined Senator Welch, Secretary Tebbets, officials from the farming community and others for a tour of a farm in Essex. So far, we know of about 10,000 acres of farmland that has been impacted by the flooding. The message we got yesterday that's so important for the producers to hear is report your damage. For structures and equipment, use 211. But for your crops, produce, and livestock, and I know this gets complicated. It needs to go through the Farm Service Agency, FSA. You can learn more at agriculture.vermont.gov slash flood. Senator Welch made it very clear that we need to have firm numbers on losses in order to build our case in Washington for additional help. Much like the importance of meeting the threshold for individual assistance in, in counties, it's also important for Sen uh, Secretary Vilsack when determining whether the U.S. Department of Agriculture grants my request for a disaster declaration. So again, to our farmers and producers, I know as you're dealing with all the stress from the floods, the last thing you want to do is uh, is report things uh, to uh, the FSA. But it's so important and could be the difference between whether or not Congress provides financial assistance and grants to you and other farmers. Lastly, and I know you've heard uh, this from me before, but I need to stress it again. For everyone, individuals and businesses of all kinds, please report, just report your damage to 211. 
Either call 211 or even better, go to vermont211.org to report your damage. Even if your basement flooded and you've already taken care of it, report it. A few of our counties have not met the threshold for individual assistance, and I know they need it. So please help your neighbors and report your damage. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Thank you for being here. I will provide some information on ongoing state emergency operations center activities, also known as the SEOC. The SEOC has been fully activated since July 9th, the afternoon of July 9th. The SEOC serves as the coordinating umbrella for all partner resources, including the National Guard, FEMA, the Red Cross, 211, and more. If you see one of those partners in your community, you see the state of Vermont in action. It is through these partners and our constant coordination and communication that we are addressing needs on the ground. Together with our partners, our initial response and rescue phase resulted in 211 people and 20 animals rescued, plus 127 people evacuated by our urban search and rescue teams. There were 74 hazardous material team responses in the early phase of the storm damage. The SEOC coordinated the opening of 14 state and local shelters, ultimately serving over 100 displaced Vermonters. As we shifted to recovery efforts, the SEOC remained busy servicing requests for information and resources from our municipal partners. A few examples of the type of assistance provided include providing large shipments of bottled water to 31 towns, providing dehumidifiers and fans to 25 of our hardest hit towns, providing PPE to municipalities and relief organizations, coordinating dam engineers to inspect municipally owned dams, providing geological engineers to assess slide dangers, connecting communities to drone services to survey damages, deploying rapid assessment teams to the field with plumbing, electrical, and structural inspectors who have completed over 800 inspections in both public and private buildings to date. Coordinating debris removal contracts that have so far hauled away over 228 tons, and that is just those that are on the state contract. We've addressed the loss of critical grocery stores by working with AOT to increase transportation opportunities between Hardwick and Johnson to Morrisville, and by coordinating with Shaw's Corporate to establish grocery delivery in the Ludlow area. We've addressed the loss of a local pharmacy in Hardwick by coordinating with Walgreens to provide a mobile pharmacy capability. These are just some of the ways, the many ways that our SEOC staff has problem solved to meet local needs. If your community has new or ongoing needs, here is the process to get help from the SEOC. Community members should raise requests to local leadership who will aggregate and prioritize these requests. The Emergency Management Director or local EMD for that community will contact the SEOC to make a request for assistance. This process is iterative as community needs are dynamic. Local EMDs can reach out to the SEOC 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If your community is in need, we want to hear from you. Lastly, I want to reemphasize what the governor said about reporting damages to Vermont211.org. Online reporting is preferred, but call takers are standing by to take calls from those who cannot access a computer. If your call goes to voicemail, rest assured that it will be returned in a timely manner. There is no backlog with 211 calls, and there has not been since Saturday evening. With that, I'll turn it over to General Roy, and I'll be available for questions afterwards. Thank you, ma'am. A major disaster de declaration was declared on July 14th which provided funding for emergency protective measures as well as assistance to individuals who have damages to their homes. 
as a direct result of the storm. Hazard mitigation across the state was also authorized. FEMA currently has 450 personnel in the field, including uh, uh, 14 teams, disaster survivor assistance teams, going door to door across the state to assist residents in signing up for, for assistance from FEMA and answering their questions and encouraging residents to contact 211. We have established seven mobile registration centers across the state in the eight declared counties to help people sign up. We have personnel in the state multi-agency resource centers who can assist residents in signing up for assistance. And we have established two disaster recovery centers, one in, uh, uh, in Rutland and one in Waterbury where people can go to sign up for assistance and also receive, receive help if they're having trouble with their applications. We provided bottled water uh, for the state to distribute and are providing bulk water to communities who are having water uh, systems disrupted. We are coordinating with other federal agencies to provide critical assessments to waste water treatment plants and hazardous material. And we're supporting town halls by providing answers to residents about the FEMA programs. As of today, we have visited over 6,000 homes and 330 businesses. We've approved $4.2 million in funding for uh, residents impacted by the storm. We've inspected over 1,000 homes for damages. And we've provided rental assistance for over 350 people. Residents who ad whose address is not currently in a designated area may still apply for assistance by calling the FEMA helpline at 1-800-621-3362, 1-800-621-FEMA. They're open from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. daily. If you applied for assistance for FEMA but have not notified 201, please do so. This information will, will help provide the state an overall understanding of the impact and assist in securing federal funding to not only restore the damages, but to help mitigate against future damages. The deadline to apply for assistance for individuals is 12 September 2023. To apply for assistance, you may contact, you may visit disasterassistance.gov, download the FEMA app, or call FEMA's hotline, as previously mentioned, 1-800-621-3362, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. So what's next? FEMA is here for the long haul. While we are focusing on individuals right now, we're conducting assessments on the overall damages to infrastructure. And we'll work with the state to apply for and assist with reimbursement for damages to roads, bridges, culverts, uh, and facilities. Additionally, we're working with the governor on establishing a long-term recovery for the state. This won't be a short-term mission for FEMA. We're here for the long haul. And I'll be followed by the secretary. Sir? Thank you, General Roy, and good morning. I'll give an update on Vermont's roads, rails, airports. Um, these are state roads, state-owned rail, state-owned airports, the two state dams, and also uh, a brief on the current posture for the Department of Motor Vehicles. As I believe I said last week, state road systems um, are funded through the Federal Highway Administration. We are currently tallied at $35.2 million in cost but I assure you we are nowhere near over our effort. State-owned rail, the lines that are owned by the Agency of Transportation, we are currently tallied at $62 million in damage and recovery effort. Seven roads remain closed, which is 12 miles. They are US 302 in Berry City. And I want to point out that this is a class one town highway, which is a term that we use. The closure is um, orchestrated by the city of Barrie in this case because of the local cleanup effort going on in that area. And we continue to work with them to see if there's any 
further assistance that AOT can provide to get that closure opened sooner. The work going on, as I think you probably know in that area, is some minor pavement repair and muck and cleanup operations in that stretch of Barrie. I-91 in Hartford, the I-91 northbound exit 10A ramp to I-89 southbound into the state of New Hampshire. That is closed, has been for a while now, due to uh, slope stabilization concerns on the right-hand side of the road as you're heading into New Hampshire. Vermont 131 in Weathersfield at the junction of Vermont 106 to Cavendish uh, and the junction of Vermont 103. Multiple sites along that road have washed out. Vermont 12 in Montpelier, this also is a class one town highway. The closure is controlled by the city of Montpelier. It is between Berry Street and School Street and we will work in R with the city itself and if there's anything that AOT can do to help that closure uh, come down quickly or as quickly as possible, we will do that. Vermont 30 at Bridge 42 in Jamaica between Vermont 100 and Amden Road. We will be installing a temporary bridge once that is in and the approaches are completed. That road could be reopened, but I do not have a time on that just yet. Vermont 110, which is a bridge, bridge 12 in Chelsea, Chelsea north of Upper Valley Road. Again, that needs a temporary bridge installed, which is part of the reason that route is closed. And Vermont 113, bridge 11 in Berkshire, I think one of the first that I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, closed between Darling Hill and Berkshire Center Road. Again, a temporary bridge structure will be brought in for that. Ten state roads remain partially open. Uh, we did have to close one lane last night of Vermont 15 in Johnson due to a landslide. Vermont 15 is open, but at that place in Johnson, it is restricted to one lane. The remainder of partially open roads are Vermont, US 4 rather, in Hartford, US, uh, Vermont 125 in Ripton, uh, two locations on Vermont 25 in Ripton, Vermont 103 in Cavendish, Vermont 107 in Stockbridge, US 4 in Bridgewater, Vermont 12 in Berlin, as I mentioned, Vermont 15 in uh, Hardwick, and Vermont 110 in Chelsea. We did succeed in opening two roads in the last 24 hours. Vermont 100 in Jamaica, and I'm pleased to report Vermont 100 in Bridgewater, which was the damage received on Friday the 7th of July that the governor and I witnessed the day after. That is open to one lane. To date, 129 roads have reopened since the storm began. Uh, we currently have three bridges, as I mentioned, that need temporary structures. Um, they are Berkshire, Chelsea, and Jamaica. We have conducted 475 bridge inspections across the state of Vermont, both on state bridges and town bridges. 46 were done yesterday. 296 of these inspections produced what we call findings. A finding means that we will have to go back at some point to do some follow-up work but that does not mean that the bridge is compromised or that it is unsafe. The Washington County Railroad from Montpelier Junction to Websterville. The national contracting firm, R.J. Corman, has over 50 employees working on that stretch of rail. I'm pleased to tell you that as of 1030 this morning, an engine made it from Montpelier Junction to the roundabout by McGee Ford. There were some rail cars that have been stranded there and those are able to now get out to the main line. We do not have a completion date from that location up through to um, Websterville. So that 11 miles will remain out of service. The Green Mountain Railroad from Bellis Falls to Rutland. I reported last week that we did have a win with 25 miles of that line opened from Bellis Falls to Ludlow that is able to now serve the talc mill in Ludlow, Vermont. There were two landslides in Chester on that line last night. So we are closely watching what the hillsides are doing, but at this time they did not close that, that road. 27 miles, however, of the Green Mountain do remain closed from Ludlow to Rutland. 
Today, we have increased our contractor count by nine. We are working with 50 contractors across Vermont. This is just AOT. We are actively working with 13 towns. Just the other day, we pushed out $6.9 million in town highway grant funding that otherwise would not have gone out till October. And we will look at future payments on an accelerated basis as well. Those are typically made quarterly. I'd like to speak a moment about the posture at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Montpelier office remains closed to the public in all online services, mail transactions, and support for all of our business partners, which include Vermont dealerships, Vermont inspection stations, AGC, commercial trucking industry, and such, are being supported internally from the location on State Street, including driver improvement functions, hearings, suspensions, and reinstatements. The Dummerston Satellite Office will remain closed through August to allow staff to support the other Southern Satellite Offices. The other physical locations for DMV, Newport, South Burlington, Rutland, Springfield, and Bennington and White River remain open to the public as scheduled. You can find their hours of operation on the DMV website at www.dmv.vermont.gov. We continue to encourage our residents to use the DMV online service for registration renewals, license renewals, and temporary registrations for purchases of all vehicles. By using these tools, you will receive a temporary document to support your transaction. It's also important to remember that registration and license renewals have been extended for 60 days under the governor's emergency order. This also includes out-of-state registrations that otherwise would have had to transfer to Vermont. And lastly, I'll say that any mail that may have been at the Montpelier Post Office the day of the flood is not accessible. It is undetermined how much, if any, mail for DMV was lost. We believe this may be impacting from July 4th to July 10th. All business partners are being contacted for that awareness and the impact on other customer mail and transactions is undetermined at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. And we'll now open up to questions. Governor, for counties like Orleans County, what is the threshold to, for people to report to actually receive that individual? Yeah, again, it's a very, and I'll let uh, General Roy uh, talk about this a little bit more, but it really is a very complicated formula, and uh, some of it has to do with uh, um, the number of people in the county and the poverty level and so forth and so on. Everything gets mixed in, and then they determine whether we meet the threshold or not. So I don't think it's something that we can define from the podium, or maybe not at all. In I some think of I can respects. add more to what you said, sir. Thank you, Governor. Uh, as the Governor said, it is a, a very complicated factor. Um, you know, the first thing we were to look at is the number of homes that were destroyed and damaged, whether they were minor or major, uh, and then overall, the other number of homes that were affected across the, the county. Uh, and then, as the Governor said, you know, what's the overall uh, demographics for the, pop uh, for the county? Uh, you know, what's the poverty level? Um, you know, what are the greatest challenges? Are the roads cut off that are impacting a, a people's ability to go about their daily business? So there are a number of factors that, that, that FEMA looks at. And what, what's the concern there if a county like Orleans never makes that threshold? What does that mean for their recovery in the long term? Well, of course, the direct result is, is those individuals aren't eligible for FEMA assistance. Um, and for uh, the maximum grant that's available for FEMA, uh, is $41,000 based upon the damage. That's the maximum amount you can get. There's actually been six Vermonters who have received that already. Um, and then it's everything from a couple hundred dollars for potential damages for uh, renters, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's, you know, that's the totality of it. Uh, and again, we encourage everybody 
to, if you've applied for assistance from, C, uh, from FEMA, also call, contact 211. Can't emphasize that enough because it gives the state a totality understanding of the damages and, and may help it secure additional funding uh, to help mitigate in the days ahead. And the information that you've seen so far, is Orleans County close? So I, I, I can't speak to that. Um, we have teams from the region who do that assessment, working closely with the state and locals, uh, and then uh, the state and the region work together, region out of Boston, uh, submit the package to, uh, to headquarters. So I, I can't speak to that, sir. This might be a question for Commissioner Morrison. Do you have a, a total tally for the number of people who have been displaced from their homes throughout the duration of this, including people who stay in the friendly home and home? So that last part is very hard to calculate. People who just went to, to a friend, a family, or went out of state and have not come back to their home. We have some numbers. I want to make sure that we get you ac the most accurate numbers we have. We are in the process of matching 211 data to, f to FEMA numbers that might reflect whether we're, you know, 211 and FEMA are, re are, are receiving the same amount of reports and the same overall nature of what the report is. Um, so we will, I'll do my best to get back to you on that. Can you remind me, Jason? Um, but I don't have a number off the top of my head. And, and clearly it's a very dynamic number. Some people left in the initial um, evacuations or just out of an abundance of caution and are now coming back. So displaced in the beginning might not be long-term displaced. It's a very dynamic number, but we will do our best to put our arms around something quantifiable for you. you. You're welcome. With those displacements, there's been the monitors across the state hesitant to report damages because they're worried about having to leave their homes. Is there any form of long-term plan on housing people if, say, it's really unhealthy for them to be found in these places? So yes, we are working on a long-term plan. We were, let's be very clear, we were working on the housing solution long-term prior to the flood. This was a known issue that the governor can speak more to or Secretary Samuelson can speak more to. The flooding just increased the number of people who are going to be in need of either short-term or potentially long-term uh, secure housing. So the short answer to your question is yes, we are actively planning and there are no easy solutions for this situation. In terms of homes that may become uninhabitable because of mold or and something else that happens as a result of the flood, that's going to be a dynamic number that might not we might not know the full extent of for four to six, eight weeks. And those people will be rolled into the number that we're working with. Governor, did you want to say more about that? Again, reporting the damage to 211 is so important because the congressional delegation is working on a supplemental ask of Congress uh, to provide in, uh, for amounts in excess of $41,000 dollars that the uh, General Roy had uh, talked about. So again, we are, it's not lost on us uh, that uh, the challenge ahead and the number of people who are displaced and uh, may never go back uh, to where they lived previously. So we are actively pursuing all avenues in order to provide for their relief. Secretary Flynn, I'm wondering, I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned uh, $35 million. Could you tell us what that, that number represents? <clears throat> Thank you. That number represents the cost of the AOT response to this point on state-owned roads, which, again, our funding comes through the Federal Highway Administration, not through FEMA. So not to confuse the <laughs> subject, we also own rail property, which is FEMA eligible. So that was that other number that I gave you. But the 35 million number is our current tally with the Federal Highway Administration for the work that AOT has been doing on all of the roads that I've been listing that have either been closed or partially closed. So that doesn't necessarily represent what your estimated damage to the road system is? Uh, in totality, that is correct. It does not represent that yet because we don't have that number yet because mm -hmm. our work is not over with. And when Secretary uh, Buttigieg was here, 
Right. We could go yesterday, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, he encouraged state officials to apply for the infrastructure grants that, I don't know if it would redesign some mm -hmm. of the road projects, but try to mitigate future flood damage. And right. I think the application deadline was in the middle of August or something like that. Is that something that you plan to take advantage of? Well, I, and I think some of that has to do with FEMA funding with respect to building things back with uh, more resiliency. I know we did that at Tropical Storm Irene, especially with a lot of uh, local uh, bridges, but even on the federal highway side. So our entire financial book of business comes through the Highway Trust Fund. It comes through the reauthorization, which we're in the middle of right now, which is the 2JA, if you will. It's a five-year tranche of money. And so anything we're doing in typical project order, we are trying to rebuild things in a better, more resilient fashion. And I think that's part of the reason why we didn't see as many bridges wiped out in this flood as we did in Irene. So the answer would be yes, we will continue to look for every unique pocket of money. Uh, there are grant programs through the U.S. Department of Transportation for uh, bridges and culverts, if you will, which are separate and aside from our uh, expected funding stream through the FAST Act or the reauthorization, and we apply for these on a routine basis. Uh, we are very aggressive about applying for grants that are available. And I, I just want to make sure everyone is clear on this. $35 million is just the initial response, getting the roads back open for now. That does not include uh, permanent replacement of bridges and culverts and roadways and so forth and paving it's just our initial response to date so it's going to the magnitude of that is going to be you know many times over um, by the time we're done governor what is and maybe for the secretary what, what is your message to vermonters who might be frustrated by the inconvenience of having to take sometimes quite a long way to yeah, I mean, I mean there, there may be some frustration there, but uh, put yourself in the, in the place of someone who's displaced from their home, still mucking out their home in the city of Barrie or in Montpelier uh, or their business. Um, it pales in comparison. So a little uh, inconvenience on the part of having to go around, at least you can get around. Uh, some of these folks are, um, are suffering a great loss and uh, can't even get into their homes to stay. The secretary actually just mentioned just touched upon it, but the work that we did during Irene, bridges, culverts, replacing all of those, how much of a difference do you think that, that made? Or was this a different type of, a different dynamic? I, I, I'll let the Secretary answer part of that, but I can, I know from experience uh, seeing some of the disaster areas, um, I was one of the first uh, to come into Brandon, as a matter of fact, I don't know if you remember, um, but there was a pizza uh, business, a pizza building. It was right in the middle of Route 7. Uh, so I had uh, orchestrated with someone I knew in the industry uh, that uh, was able to get a crane in, lift that out of the way because it was blocking the road. Uh, today, <clears throat> that, uh, that culvert that went through there was undersized. So with the, uh, with the transportation dollars and, and the foresight, uh, that was upgraded. And they didn't have the devastation, the damage this time around that they did then. Um, so a lot of what we did after Irene helped, and uh, that's the hardening, that's the mitigation measures uh, that we need to continue to do. So we talk a lot about climate change, right? I mean, we want to, we talk about reducing our emissions, carbon emissions, and so forth, and that's that's good work, and that's something that we're focused on. But it has to be con combined with an equal effort on mitigation. There's going to have to be buyouts. There's going to have to be uh, replacement in, in different using different different technology and different strategies so that we don't, because we know we're going to flood again in certain areas. But we can't just focus on just carbon emissions. We have to f focus on mitigation. You, you mentioned buyouts. Do you mean buying people out of their homes? Yes. Or yeah. Where are you in the thought process? Well, I mean, we're two weeks into this, right? Two weeks ago, we had the flooding. Um, so first things first, uh, trying to uh, focus on the initial response. But we are having meetings, um, trying to determine what we do next and make sure that we're doing it for the right reasons. 
Um, but that's why it's so important uh, to have these discussions uh, with our congressional delegation because FEMA is not going to be able to take care of this. We're not going to be able to take care of this on our own. We're going to need congressional help with a supplemental bill in order to, to have, um, you know, move forward on some of these buyouts that we know are going to have to happen in the future. But we want to build back. We want to build back better uh, and smarter and uh, make sure that we're, we're, you know, investing in our downtowns and so forth, but doing it in a much different way. Well, would you mind explaining a bit the, the FEMA buyout process and how that works? That falls under our, our National Flood Insurance uh, Program. Uh, and so each, each community who participates in the National Flood Insurance Program um, works with uh, the region, in this case in Boston, uh, to assess the homes and see the, the totality of the damage. Uh, and if, if the cost of, of repairing a home uh, is more than just taking it down um, then that's the decision that the community will make. Uh, so it's, it's really it's a community level decision. They establish the prices associated with the properties, um, and it's a collaborative effort. So is it would owners get fair market value for their home? Or? It's up to each community as to how they assess the values of the homes. And if I could just ask, add one thing on the mitigation discussion. Um, we all remember 2017 pretty well, some more than others. Um, having been at, in headquarters. Um, remember Harvey Irma Maria. But if I said Nate, how many people here will remember that Nate? Nate was a hurricane that came in um, into the, uh, a different area in Alabama that had been hit years before. And because of the mitigation they had done by elevating homes, um, by uh, adjusting culvers and so forth, the, the damages were, were relatively minor, and it was because it was a great example of the mitigation uh, dollars being effective. I think the estimate today is, is for every dollar you invest in mitigation, right, you offset six dollars from impact from a disaster, from a future disaster. Uh, I'm currently working uh, an older disaster, older as in this last Christmas, uh, for the Christmas storms, um, in which the utilities were hit pretty hard. Uh, but we have great examples where the utilities had used mitigation to uh, help mitigate against future storms, and in fact they did. Uh, those lines that we mitigate, mitigated on from previous disasters held up this time. So as the governor has said, you know, we really need to look at how we rebuild and ensure to, that we are in a better place. Um, Vermont is stronger after the storm than it was prior to. And I think that's the focus we have. You mentioned the correlation between buyouts and the National Flood Insurance Program. Does a, an individual need to have flood insurance in order to be bought out of their home? They have to be participating in the flood insurance program, yes. On an individual Yes, ma'am. Okay. That is my understanding. I could be wrong. I'll get back to you if I, I am wrong. Okay. So that would take out the mobile home parks I mentioned that are a lot of them that are in the floodplain already and don't have flood insurance. Yeah, I can't speak to that, sir, at this point in time. But we can provide great information for you in the future. Yeah. Just, just remember, um, that's why I'm, I keep talking about the congressional work that's being done for a supplemental bill to assist in areas like that. Uh, I think there are uh, a number of buyouts that need to take place in different areas, um, but we, we're going to FEMA under the present structure, can't do that. Um, but uh, that's why we need supplemental funding in order to accomplish that. I want to have uh, Secretary Moore comment further. Thank you, Governor. Um, I just want to draw attention to the Flood Resilient Communities Fund, which is an, a joint initiative of the Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Public Safety uh, that we've been advancing for the last two years now with some of the ARPA funds to fill gaps uh, where FEMA isn't able to, to come in and offer relief to individual property owners. Uh, we created a, a special fund using ARPA dollars to affect some of those buyouts and to, to great success so far and happy to provide additional details on that program. Um, in addition, the, the governor's budget included in 
uh, money we needed to access uh, pre-disaster, pre-hazard mitigation dollars that were available to Vermont in fairly significant supply as a result of the way we accessed FEMA funding through the COVID crisis. And so taken together, those two programs have given us tools uh, we've never had in the past um, to, to do this work, and that is work we've been actively engaged in for the last 24 or so months, uh, well in advance of this particular event. In terms of the, the buyout price, I, I'm sure part of the calculation I would think would have to be the fact that home prices in Vermont have skyrocketed, and if you get below fair market value for the house that was destroyed, how are you supposed to find it? Right. In, in, in general, that, that's part of the Flood Resilient Communities Program as well, is trying to make sure people are being compensated at fair market value. That's not to say that a home well outside a floodplain and flood hazard area may not have a higher, val higher starting value just on principle, um, but at least allowing fair compensation for the, the home the, the resident is currently in. Um, since uh, manufactured homes were brought up, is the state thinking about putting together a program to focus on helping people in those communities. Like I think there was one after I Yeah, um, it's something that I was part of as well. And uh, yes, we are we are actively pursuing that. Uh, we don't want them to feel forgotten, um, but we're trying to assess all the damage at this point and determine where we go from here. There is, um, through different levels, there is some FEMA uh, funding available for short-term replacement and so forth of those homes um, that we are actively in looking into and uh, working with uh, General Roy on that. Governor, as you know, when it comes to supplemental FEMA assistance working its way through Congress, maybe, as you know, we are in a divided Congress. There have been political fights over uh, FEMA funding in the past, and even after Sandy. How confident are you, or what's the concern there uh, of, you know, the timeline that we face for some of this money to get through Congress and whether we'll actually get there. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, always concerned about the polarization uh, in Congress, um, but but these storms, um, they don't just affect blue states, they don't just affect red states, uh, they affect all states. And uh, so I think, uh, I think there's a realization uh, amongst uh, Congress, members of Congress, that it could be them next if it already hasn't been them. So uh, I think there's a certain sensitivity to that. But you're aware of a, there's a huge fight going down in Congress, primarily on a partisan basis between the House Republicans and the Senate Democrats about a whole slew of funding bills. Then this is just getting dumped in the middle of that enormous fight. And there are some people down here, down there, who are saying, we're not going to allocate additional money for disasters unless you cut somewhere else. I mean, do you really have confidence that this well, that the system that, can solve this? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have as much confidence as uh, is, is needed, um, but I think there is a realization. Well, we'll take, uh, for instance, there's been uh, damage in northern New York. Uh, I know uh, Representative Stefanik is, uh, is looking into supplemental funding as well, right? Um, so uh, we have Senator Schumer, who represents the whole state. So I imagine that they might want to get together. Um, we're, we're having this damage in New Hampshire. I don't know how much, um, but they may need some help as well. So when you regionalize this um, and cross party lines, I think anything is possible. And I think that we've proven that time and time again, where there was uh, Senator Grassley and Senator Leahy working together on many different initiatives to help one another out with the realization that again, uh, these storms don't don't just go to a red state or a blue state. They hit them all, and uh, and and I think it could be whoever is being uh, the obstacle. Their state could be next. Would it be fair to say that you are absolutely depending on this congressional funding in order to make a recovery? Yeah, uh, no, no. We are going to make a recovery, um, but we can make a better recovery if we have additional funding. So again. FEMA has been very supportive of our efforts. Um, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Transportation has been very supportive of our efforts. There are pathways within the system now that will help us recover. 
we will use, we'll, again, we'll uh, uncover uh, every uh, opportunity uh, for us with funding and so forth that we can release uh, to provide flexibility within state resources as well. So it's all hands on deck. And, uh, and this would just help us um, make a, a better recovery, a fuller recovery, if we have uh, congressional help. Governor, I'd like to talk about uh, post offices and schools. Uh, the Montpelier Post Office had the same warning as the rest of us about the flood coming. Have you asked them, have they told you why they couldn't keep the mail high and dry? I have not. Okay. Um, the other question I have is uh, how many schools do we have now that are so damaged that they may have difficulty reopening in late August? Yeah. I think, uh, Secretary Boucher, I think you had provided a couple of numbers for the six or seven schools that were heavily impacted. suggested to us that this stuff has all got to go to Coventry. I don't know if that's true. Uh, is that true? Is this? Oh, we, have, we only have one landfill pretty much in the state. So everything, all the damage and debris is going to Coventry and is, uh, yeah, is I think I think it gets, it gets it gets a little bit more complicated than that because, okay. because some of the silt and uh, affected soils and maybe Secretary Moore could answer some of that. Uh, needs to be segregated and, and trucked to a different location, I believe, be aerated and so forth. We have uh, several different debris management uh, strategies that are being deployed. The governor is correct, though. Coventry is our only landfill, and to the extent there's material that needs to go to a landfill, that is where it has to go. Uh, contractors have been working to identify some staging areas where they can, can drop the loads out of the big trucks that are being used in the downtown areas to collect debris. Uh, further sorted a little bit, removing some of the, the valuable recyclable materials and then trucking the remains to Coventry. Uh, we have been encouraging homeowners as they're cleaning out their basements to try to segregate household hazardous waste um, and electronic waste and are working with partners in the solid waste management entities to arrange opportunities to collect those materials separately that we know we don't want to get mixed into that general trash stream. In addition, um, in locations where there's sediment and soils that have been impacted by petroleum products, uh, we have set up separate areas where those for those soils to be taken to um, so that they can be managed appropriately and reduce further environmental contamination. So it really is a multifaceted approach. Um, and through the SEOC, there's a debris team that involves staff from the Department of Environmental Conservation, along with other experts from the, the hazardous spill or the hazmat team um, that have collectively put together this strategy. I think we have two people on the line. We'll start with Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. I have no questions. Thank you. 
and Tim and Quiston from My Business Magazine. Uh, nothing right now, thank you. Right. Sarah? Um, you brought up the uh, uh, supplemental appropriations bill from Congress, and you also mentioned Senator Leahy, and we all know that he had such a legacy for really bringing home the baby. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's something that you're thinking about now that he's not in office anymore. I've been thinking about that ever since he left office. Okay. Governor, you mentioned climate just a little bit ago. Um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to see this morning yet, but the Secretary of State put out a message this morning saying that not enough in the state has been done in terms of climate and mentioned that not enough climate legislation has been passed. Um, but you did mention building back more resiliency in mind. So, uh, do you have any additional comments? Uh, I haven't seen the op-ed, but uh, but again, I believe climate change is real. I think that we need to transition away from carbon emissions, um, but we also have to have a balance here, right? I mean, we need to make sure that we're resilient and we mitigate this damage at the same time, because regardless, if we could magically throw a switch and eliminate uh, carbon uh, from from society, that wouldn't stop this storm from happening the storm next year, the storm 10 years from now. Um, it's, it's just something that's going to take some time for, uh, for, for the world to, to heal. So we, uh, at the same time that we're doing that work and transitioning, you know, with electric vehicles and, and heat pumps and so forth and upgrading our, our grids and, and uh, electrical systems and so forth and so on, it, it takes time and money and resources and and a workforce uh, that can actually do the work. So at the same time we're doing that, <clears throat> we need really that resilience, the hardening, the mitigation steps in order to accomplish that. Anything you want to add to that? Governor, also speaking of some of the, <clears throat> the congressional money, but also um, I believe on Thursday there's going to be a joint hearing with House and Senate lawmakers talking about sort of where do we stand with this flood? Does the legislature need to get involved? What do you expect, or will you be making or making plans for maybe grant funding or, or anything in your upcoming budget? I know it's, it's early, but where, where's the legislature? Yeah, I, I don't know. And uh, we'll be um, testifying as much as we can on, on Thursday, and, um, but we still have a lot of work to do uh, with the recovery. Uh, and uh, these just the initial response. We're just we're still in the initial re response phase and transitioning to recovery. Um, so we'll update them as best as we can, um, and um, and then we'll have to see where we're at uh, as we move forward. We have uh, funding available now. We're receiving help from FEMA, uh, and again uh, transportation funds. So. We feel we're we're in good shape from a financial standpoint today, um, but uh, but we're going to need some help in the future. With that funding, we talked a lot about state loans. But is there any grant funding or loans maybe from the state available for people who live on private loans who are responsible for fixing those culverts? Yeah, again, that would be over and above what FEMA covers, uh, and it doesn't qualify under public assistance either. Um, so that's one of those areas where um, we're going to, we want you to report the damage uh, so that we can get the magnitude of the, the amount to give uh, our congressional delegation the tools they need to make the ask for what is it in totality, what is the damage in Vermont, and what's not covered. So that's why it's so important for people to keep reporting the damage they have and they suffer, even if they know they won't qualify today. Um, it makes the case for supplemental funding. Is the state doing anything to hold accountable absentee landlords? My colleague has begun hearing reports from tenants whose landlords aren't picking up their phones or aren't coming to fix you know, food damage. Um, I might ask if Commissioner Hanford has any information on that. It's, this is something I, I hadn't heard much about, but. Um, it, it, that, that's a difficult uh, answer to question to answer directly. What folks that are renters should do is to one one report their damage and register with FEMA. Um, 
renters are eligible for FEMA assistance. Their landlords to repair the property are eligible for SBA loans. So it's a difficult situation for a renter that is in a damaged apartment. Um, but the fact is that their property owner, their landlord, will need to fix that. Um, and the renter is eligible for rental assistance to find temporary housing while the landlord fixes the property. The landlord is eligible for an SBA loan to fix the property at this point. So um, I heard a comment earlier about folks being uh, afraid to report damages. Th that, that shouldn't be the case. FEMA is not um, condemning and, and kicking people out of, of damaged properties, but the renters that are affected need to report their damage and get FEMA assistance to help support their temporary housing needs in the short term while uh, repairs can take place. Sarah, as well, if you have names, if anyone has names of, of these absentee landlords, um, please get them to us and we'll do everything we can to make contact. I think that's important we, through public safety and otherwise. As far as, Commissioner, why have you, as far as uh, reporting damages to FEMA, if it's structural damage to the building that the landlord owns, I mean, shouldn't that be the landlord's burden to bear, to coordinate with FEMA? That, that's a really big ask of someone who doesn't own the No, I think it's, it's, it's I think what, Mr. Hanford is talking about his personal belongings, anything that they might have lost within, within the home themselves, not the building. Okay. Right, exactly. The, the renter is eligible for FEMA assistance for temporary rental assistance to find uh, a place to live temporarily. The landlord's responsible for fixing it. Um, under the process and the funding that exists now, that landlord um, goes to SBA to get a loan. So some of these landlords have also lost their property and their livelihood. Um, and, and so it, FEMA looks at individual assistance for homeowners and for renters in, in two different ways. Uh, a rental property is a business and, and will be eligible for SBA loans. Time for maybe one or two more. Governor, was it uh, announced, I guess, last week, maybe that there'd be 20-ish million dollars in grants for businesses through ACCD. Do you know when we might get more? Details? We're hoping Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> Secretary Flynn, just to follow up, but you mentioned uh, license suspension hearings. So mm -hmm. those are still happening. Correct. Yes. What if someone can't get to, like, physically get to their hearing? I, I would recommend they contact the DMV and try to get through to the hearing officer to at least describe what their situation is. Okay. Yeah. Is there an estimate when DMV and Montpelier is going to be back up mm -hmm. and operating for the public? Um, I, I couldn't give you that right now, but I don't think it's going to be that long. I think some of it has to do with the overall citywide recovery work that's still occurring on State Street and, you know, directing thousands of, I mean, literally DMV downtown at 120 can see two to 3,000 people on a given week, foot traffic. So I think some of that is keeping in mind what's also happening downtown right at the moment. Yeah, any transactions, I, I found myself um, when I had to register a number of motorcycles over the last couple of weeks. Um, I went online to do it. I hadn't done that before, but it's very easy to do. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Glad to hear that going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much.